There is a Chinese folk tale about a woman whose only son died. In her grief, she went to the holy man. She went to her rabbi and asked, "What prayers, what rituals, what magical incantations do you have to bring my son back to life?" Instead of sending her away, for she sought the impossible, he comforted her. He comforted her with the following instruction. He said, "Fetch me a mustard seed." From a home that has never known sorrow, we will use it to drive the sorrow out of your life, and in that way, your son will always be with you. So the woman set off at once in search of the magical mustard seed, to be found in a home that never knew sorrow. She first came to a splendid mansion, knocked at the door, and said, "I'm looking for a home that has never known sorrow. Is this such a place?" They told her, "Dear woman, you've certainly come to the wrong house." And they described the tragic things that had recently befallen them. The woman asked herself, "Then, who is better able to help these poor, unfortunate people than I, who have had misfortune of my own?" And so she stayed for a while, and she comforted them, and then she went on in her search for a home that had no sorrow. You can imagine how the story plays out. You are not surprised, but she was surprised that wherever she turned, a small hovel or a grand palace, she never found one home that was without sadness or misfortune. At every doorstep, she asked herself, "Who is better to help these unfortunate people than I, who have had misfortune of my own?" Ultimately, the woman became so involved in the mitzvah of ministering to other people's grief that she set aside the quest for the mustard seed and realized that already it had tempered her grief, and she had found comfort in her mourning for her son, and he was near to her. This folk tale. Might agitate because it's so simple, too simple. But is there truth in it? Can loss lead to something good? Can heartache open us up to something meaningful and purposeful? I believe it can. The biblical book of Ruth is evidence of it. When Ruth became a young widow, it seemed she had lost everything: her chance at having children, her standing in the community, her chance at seeking a better life across the border. But because of her extraordinary ability to connect with others, her knack for chesed, loving loyalty, not only to her mother-in-law Naomi. But to the people that she had inherited through marriage, and loyalty also to her God, each one of these sustained her in such a way that she did not only endure her loss, but she was strengthened and blessed with greater love, eventually with great progeny of her own, with a shem tov, with a good name in her own time. All the way down to this day, in how we speak of her. David Kushner wrote in a recent article in the New Yorker, the title, "Can Trauma Help You Grow?" David Kushner asks this question after recounting and reflecting upon the trauma that came to his family when he was young. His brother was kidnapped and murdered. In their home in Tampa, Florida, and so he's done research over the years and writes about post-traumatic growth. Psychologists have long studied resilience, the ability to bounce back and move on, but he's interested in something more than survival. Post-traumatic growth is documented by way of hundreds of studies. How is it different from mere survival? Post-traumatic growth is what happened when trauma 
changes and deepens life's meaning. In 1975, three years after his brother died, his mother wrote the following in her journal as she was reflecting on what she had found for herself during those three years of grief. A way of living with death that brought new meaning to her life. She wrote, I treasure what I treasure. I am aware of the temporariness, temporariness of relationships and of life itself. I am aware of what matters and of what matters to me. Did my son John give me this gift of insight? I believe so. My sweet, sweet sweetness, I thank you for that. I carry you with me forever unseen now, just as I did when you were unseen growing in my womb, unseen but filling my belly and my mind. You were part of our family even before you were born, and you are part of our family now, even after your death. Thank you for this capacity to love and to understand. Do you know that you are still loved? In his recent book on this phenomenon, Post-Traumatic Growth, Stephen Joseph writes about what doesn't kill us. He describes victims of trauma experiencing enhanced relationships, greater self-acceptance, and a heightened appreciation of life. To only look at the dark side and the negative side of loss is to miss out on something very important. Now, I should say, for clarity's sake, I don't believe this is causal. I don't believe we should think for a moment that someone has suffered and died in order for one of us to have greater insight and deeper meaning. That's not how this goes. It is not cause and effect that way. We don't say things like, he's in a better place now, or he was so good, she was so good, that God needed her in heaven. No, we want them more, and God can wait. But I do believe that when loss comes, it can open something, us, something of us up. The existence of post-traumatic growth suggests that while the pain never vanishes, something new and powerful is likely to come. Again, Kushner's wife is quoted for telling him and his surviving brother Andy it's like after a spring gets pushed all the way down, it is able to rise even higher. And his father wrote, after you've understood that it will be different, that death cannot be undone, and that you will continue to live nonetheless, something arises. The question becomes then, what shall I do with the rest of my life? And I believe that is why we have come for Yiskor, to reflect on our life since the loss of our loved one. How have we grown since then? What more might we yet become in order to make our loved one still proud of us? Not everyone experiences such growth after trauma, we know. In recent years, psychologists have studied survivors of cancer, war, and terrorist attacks and have found that there are certain traits that make it more likely, such as optimism, extroversion, and openness to new experiences. And also, it won't surprise you, a supportive community. These are the ingredients to make it more likely that after a loss, even trauma, we can find deeper meaning and a richer life, nonetheless. I think of our congregant, Matilda Biggio, who usually sits right here. She isn't strong enough this Shavuot to come and sing Hallel, but I imagine in her room in Baycrest, she's singing. Matilda has suffered terrible losses in her lifetime. She's lost both her husband, and her two children. 
And at the Shiva home years ago then, Rabbi Marmer told her, Matilda, mitzvot will keep you strong. And she made good on that promise. Still does, in fact, with every ounce of strength. That is her devotion to her people and to her God, and that is how she has found meaning after mourning. So where is our God in this equation? Our rabbis teach that every person has three parents. Our parents of flesh and blood give us our body. In fact, the rabbis go so far as to specify that our bones and our teeth and the whites of our eyes come from our mothers, from our fathers, excuse me, and the blood and the muscle and the hair and the darks of our eyes come from our mother. It's a strange lesson in anatomy, I know, but they were right about one thing, that third parent. The third parent, our sages teach, is the Holy One, blessed be God, who provides our soul. I find this teaching comforting and instructive. First, children, elders, at the last stage of life, and everyone in between, we take comfort in knowing that God has helped us to come into this world, into this life. Avinu, we say, our parent, God as the creator of human souls. When each person on the planet who ever lived and ever will be walks through life with a unique soul, how could it be otherwise? each one crafted, just so, by the divine maker. And if the human soul is of divine origin, then it easily flows that when we die and our bodies of flesh and blood return to the earth, our souls return to God. Soon we will rise for El Malay Rachamim when we ask for God to watch over and protect the souls of our beloved dead. God is their parent, who holds them in close embrace for all time. And finally, if God is the third parent, then it means that God also suffers a loss when one of God's children dies. God also mourns each and every human death because God is diminished by those human deaths, as it were. And that means that God also needs comfort. And so we say Kaddish, not only to remember our loved ones who have died, not only to comfort one another, but also to comfort God. We offer these words of praise to strengthen God, as it were. Magnified and sanctified are you, Adonai. With these words, we buoy God's spirits, as it were. We remind God that God is not alone in that grief. Our voices of prayer and our drawing nearer to God on Yisker days, our very presence in synagogues throughout the lands on these holy days are a source of comfort to God, who mourns the loss of so many millions of children. How else could God endure the magnitude of such a loss? Is this God personified? Yes. But our sages were not afraid to go there in their teaching. Does the Midrashic metaphor bring comfort to us who mourn? Does it help us to find greater meaning and purpose in our service to God, in our drawing nearer to God? I hope so. And does it draw God nearer to us? That is our prayer at this hour.